Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special episode of Shorts in Focus where we show short films love. We are proud to give an audience to independent and student filmmakers to come on the show, to show their work, to have it be seen by a national audience. And this is a movement. This is a movement and we are so glad that you are part of it. This is a special episode. It's our first pre-produced episode. I'm here with my uh, co-host. Matt Chabalone. And our guest for the day, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, uh, Jacqueline Rogers, um, independent filmmaker. Uh, the film that we're going to watch is actually, or clips from it, is my thesis film from graduate school. Mm -hmm. So um, I did a one-year graduate school um, up in Connecticut at Sacred Heart University, um, and the program was called, uh, the, well, it's their Sacred Heart University, and it's their film and television master's program. Okay, okay. And so this, what we're seeing will be a thesis film. Yeah, it's my thesis film that I made actually, wow, it was like a year ago last summer, like literally to this day. Wow, nice, yeah. nice, nice. So this is, uh, this is symbolic. Yeah, it is. You know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, can you tell us the name of your film and tell us a little bit about it? So um, my, the short film is called Kelly. Uh, my friends and I always joke around about how it's literally a short film. It's about like four minutes and 58 seconds runtime. Mm. Um, and it's about a young girl who comes to terms with her life in foster care. Okay, okay. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty deep... It is, it's really deep. <laughs> it's a pretty deep topic. Yeah. Um, what's your inspiration for that? Um, so I'm very big, I mean, a lot of people, I guess, kind of assume that um, I was adopted, but I was, wasn't. Um, and, but I've had friends throughout my life who have been adopted. Um, a, most of my friends have been overseas. Um, but a lot of, I'm just very big on found, like what I call found families. Cause like, you know, your friends are the people or your family that you get to choose. So I kind of wanted to explore that. And a lot of my inspirations that I drew from that were, uh, I'm a huge fan of the show, the fosters, which is on, well, it was ABC family and they just switched to Freeform, and it's absolutely great. And it's it also deals with, uh, foster care and the foster system. Okay. Um, another huge inspiration was, um, a Disney movie called meet the Robinsons, mm -hmm. um, which again deals with adoption. And I pulled a lot of in, like, stuff from, or I guess a lot of my, not a lot of my ideas, but that I think had more impact on a lot of things. And then there's this really great um, father-daughter relationship on one of my other favorite shows, and there's a little influence on that too, so. Is this the first time I'm actually addressing this topic in general? That I am? Yeah. Yes, yeah, no, and I don't, I, like I said, I think it's just there's something, to me there's something interesting about two people kind of coming together and finding each other, and I think, e you know, the media doesn't really talk a lot about or have a lot of positive relationships with parents, and that's kind of what I wanted to explore a little bit, mm -hmm. whether it's like a mother-daughter relationship or if it's like a father-daughter relationship, and that was something that I wanted to explore a little bit. Mother-daughter relationships and, I mean, father, mother-daughter, father-daughter, I mean, ki relationships with kids and parents right. can be complicated exactly. in general. But, exactly. you know, when you throw uh, adoption into the mix, you know, that, you harder. know, can, can take it to another level. I mean, yeah. Matt and I... So I have some some personal experience with this. You want to talk about uh, yeah, well, how you're I, connected to it? Well, <laughs> before I met Ka right before I met Kain, uh, before we both uh, met each other at grad school uh, in our film program, I was working with an organization uh, called Kids Insight that okay. uh, works with teenagers in foster care oh, wow. and progressive systems that work to really give teenagers uh, who we'll talk about later in terms right. of you know the likelihood of being adopted or being longer in foster care, a, a larger voice at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can you know, more directly impact the decisions that affect where they live and, and right. how long they'll be at place to place, which are also issues that you addressed that we're looking forward yeah. to talking to you about. Mm -hmm. And so Matt and I you know, met in, in, uh, in our master's program at AU in film. And uh, he's probably one of the first people, if not the first person that I yeah. uh, met and befriended. And we were talking, he was talking about mm -hmm. you know, the work that, that, that he had done and, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I fade in the background sometimes. Sometimes I downplay stuff. So he was just talking about it one day. And I was like, yeah, you know, that sounds interesting. You know, I'm adopted. Uh, so, you know, I kind of get in. And he was like, whoa, what? <laughs> so, yeah, I am adopted. And okay. so, which is why this... Um, hit home for right, you. Right, this project definitely yeah. hit home. I was adopted when I was a year and a half. Okay. Um, I know that I was in the foster care system. Okay. I don't remember it at all. Okay. Um, you know, what I know about it, I learned from like case notes that I, I, read, right. I read about myself. 
Um, but I, uh, I, you know, was adopted when I was a year and a half. And so, you know, this is an experience that, that I've lived. Right. right. So, you know, seeing the film is definitely like, OK, yeah, this, you know, I, I, I get this. Yeah. Um, I hear that it's a very different experience for um, youth and adolescents and teenagers, mm -hmm. because once you get to the point of sort of being cognizant of the fact that, you know, you're not living with your parents, right. um, it, you know, it, it becomes a completely different, a completely different thing. Um, but again, just knowing that that is my background made this made this film really uh Personal. really special yeah yeah definitely that's cool uh well um it's just it's interesting because i know um there are about like oh since 2014 um there've been over 400,000 kids in foster care mm -hmm. and like like i said i really wanted to touch and like touch upon that i did you know a lot of research like so much research like I went and which was weird to me because like there's online services where I mean you have your people where people well the fosters just br uh, briefly touch upon it where like for-profit foster care but which is mildly ridiculous but that's a whole different topic but like I went online and it was kind of like you know when you go online to search for a pet mm -hmm. they have the same thing for children yeah and I was like what this is, it, it was, in my head, it was just nuts. And like when I was doing research, I was like looking at a lot of the faces and I was reading a lot of case studies and I was reading just like as much as I could. And like, I was trying to find, you know, like films, like I watch a lot of documentaries, which again, there was a lot of talk about international adoption and not necessarily domestic. And that's, I think why I kind of want the domestic route than mm. international. So uh, um, my parents actually, told me this this uh, story uh, that when they first decided that they wanted to adopt yeah. they, they went into the they went into the office and once they were cleared and everything they literally handed them this like huge black book that was full of pictures oh wow and it was just like you know flip through the pictures so like it, it's, it's always been uh, you know kind of amazing to me that like you, <laughs> how did you land on and I've asked you how did you land on my picture I was like you know man it's just you know they would like it's something about your eyes um, but uh, yeah, so clearly this is this is really personal. I think we should go ahead and get into the uh, get into the film so we can we can talk cool. more about it. So let's watch this clip and uh, you know we'll talk more when we come back. Awesome. I'm not sure why kids like these things. It's the spinning. Oh, that's it. Some little kid thought it'd be funny to push me around and I got caught in it. You know, you can finally unpack now. Mr. Hargrove, the Durs, Mrs. Schaefer, the Rubinos, Mr. and Mrs. Kate. They all brought me back. Kelly, the adoption is going through. Kelly's a teenager in this film, yeah. and statistics show that teenagers are less likely to get adopted as compared with babies and, and young children. Mm -hmm. um, my cousins, I have three adopted cousins, they were all adopted very young. Um, and I've met lots of teenagers who are still waiting for that right. adoption to go through. So uh, what was your decision for picking Kelly's age in this film? That was something that I wanted to touch on a little bit just because like with a lot of the research that I did do, I found that the older kids were not the ones that were going to get adopted. Mm -hmm. Like they get adopted, like statistics show that like they don't get, they very rarely get adopted. I mean, and I think that even starts at like age seven or eight. And that's really not that old if you really think about it. Yeah. Um, so I think it was really important to who Kelly was and to kind of show 
that like, because when you think adoption, like even with people that I know who have, you know, adopted young ones, um, have all been through infancy. And like, these older kids are also just as important too. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the one, also some, sometimes um, are some of the ones that have been there through infancy or have been there for maybe like three or four years and then they're there until they age out. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I really, really like how you captured Kelly's uh, confusion, mm -hmm. angst, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, with the spinning, right, on the, uh, on the carousel, um, and how you kept cutting back and forth between the spinning and the car rides. You know, you had the, the, the spinning movement and then also the movement behind in the car. Where did you get that idea? Um, I wanted to have a visual symbol of that feeling of never being able to settle down mm -hmm. or like that feeling of like angst and annoyance and just like everything that she was emotionally feeling at that moment. And I was just like racking my brain and then I thought of like a carousel mm -hmm. and um, and then I came on. It was funny because everybody was like I wrote in the script it was like a uh, merry-go-round and they're like and literally people thought ones of like the theme parks and which was originally in my head but I was like no 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 the ones that are on a playground like because they nice. have the which are supposedly a little dangerous but whatever um, but they it just it's this big emotional thing with her and it really is that visual image um, and to the like I think it's a great visual Im image for the audience of you really get that feeling of what she's feeling in that moment and that progression of you know, when we were with uh, Corey, who's the one on the carousel, mm -hmm. and we were going through, all right, like, um, different, again, different scenarios, and um, just trying to do the progression so we had everything. Mm -hmm. What are some of the actual filmmaking techniques, though, to, to keep that sense of continuous motion that, that you're referring to? Right. Um, so, I guess, like, I mean, talent-wise, what we were doing is we, both actresses, we would give, like, a scenario. Um, uh, Pete, my cin cinematographer, who was great, um, he, he was working a lot with the talent on that moment um, just because we had a very tiny space, and it was just, like, scenarios of, okay, like, you just broke up with a boyfriend or, and not necessarily, it didn't necessarily have to pertain to that film, but um, it was just like some scenarios of where they could emotionally go to those places. Mm -hmm. So we did that with Little Kelly and we also did that with Older Kelly as well. So for those who don't know, Pete is Peter Zeke Doughty, who is the co-executive producer on this show. He did the cinematography for this film. So uh, if you liked what you saw, that's, who is uh, who's behind the scenes here making making shorts and focus run? So shout out to Zeke or Pete. There's a Pete. He, he's got like 18 names. Yeah, yeah. he's great. <laughs> and another question from this scene specifically: uh, the backpack that yes. was very yeah. symbolic yeah. as well. Uh, what was your reasoning for picking the backpack as such a, a symbolic object in this film? So when I was doing, again, like a lot of my research um, with kids in foster care, um, most of the time they really only had the clothes on their backs, mm -hmm. which like just boggled my mind. Um, and then on top of that, if they did have time to go and grab stuff, they were handed a black garbage bag. And they had about like five minutes to clear their stuff out. And in my head, I was thinking, okay, well, what if she, if she was given one item, whether it was passed down from like a foster sibling or maybe a, a little bit better of a foster uh, parents, like what would that item be? And for me, I think it was a it was a backpack. Mm -hmm. um, and the, this one works so perfectly just because it like it's drawn on and there's a yeah. lot of like the backpack itself is you bring it into the film as a character because like it starts out, you know, very stuffed and everything and it's with her through her whole journey and then by the end of it, um, which we'll see later and I'm um, she starts unpacking. Right. And where did you find that backpack? I found that backpack on eBay, and it was great. <laughs> Actually, I missed the backpack the first like yeah? the first time I watched it. I think I was so caught up with the movement because mm -hmm. we were cutting from the the movement on the uh, carousel or uh, merry-go-round, or you know, the things on the playgrounds have names, right? Tons of names. Um, but we were cutting from that movement to the movement in the car. Yeah. And it wasn't until I watched it the second time 
that I was like, it's the same backpack. It is the same backpack. You know, backpack. and again, that's that's um, like the the symbolism really hit there. Yeah. Right, because it's like okay, you get the movement, and a lot of times you watch something the first time, and it, you know, everything doesn't doesn't click the right. first time you watch right. something. But realizing that she was taking this exact same bag from house to house to house for all of these years, that really, you know, that really hit home. Mm -hmm. You know, that that uh, that was a really powerful, powerful moment. And then the the viewers with the movement, I, like I feel like it, it it sort of kept your audience tense. Were you going for that? Yeah, no, totally. And I think the spinning in general does like you just you get so not like you get nauseous, and that's definitely you know a feeling that we were wanting to get through and with the flashbacks in general we never really wanted to ever settle I think in one of the car ones either a little bit later on where I think the door doesn't necessarily slam all the way or doesn't shut all the way and mm. so right before the door closes we're already onto the next shot so it's like that progression of her going from house to house to house where she's never able to settle down like she feel like she's not she's not at home at all and it's just like this frustrated feeling that you get um, and yeah, and the backpack is great and we just, I really wanted to bring that home. I think it brings it home a lot more and it's kind of like its own little character. Mm -hmm. And that really contributed to the mood, like you said, but yeah. what, stepping back and, and thinking about how you talk to your, your crew and, and yeah. your strategies behind, you know, the, the, just the, the general tone and mood, not mm -hmm. just the pace, uh, walk us through for, for people that might have not ever made a film before. What are some of the steps you take deliberately to create uh, a, a really consistent mood throughout a short piece like this? Um, so what Pete and I did, uh, which we uh, went over and we kind of went over what like the day's events of what we were shooting and everything. And uh, my assistant director, who's a good friend of mine, Ashley, uh, she like controlled set so like so great like I barely knew as a director um, you want to know what's going on set but like it also let me she let me really focus in on the story a lot um, and it was just always an open dialogue and um, that first day Ashley uh, Pete and I would just have constant conversations about like okay well this is not working what can we do um, let's you know can we keep moving on do we have everything um, I think we stepped away several times on the first day because it's the first day mm -hmm. um, and just always had that conversation. And I think having those conversations is important of being able to like step away for like two minutes, three minutes, whatever it is. Be like, OK, well, like what's working? What's not working? Mm -hmm. When do we when can we move on? Sounds like you had a great relationship with your crew. then. Yeah, we did. And it, I was I was very lucky. Um, Ashley was absolutely fantastic. She like nailed that and she's great um and uh and then yeah um and then kevin was the ac and he was great um ben was a pa and ben was just like running around and doing everything that we could um <laughs> we also had um in one of the older shots we had like pictures so like at, later in the day we had um little kelly there so he was like the one actually doing the photography when we were doing other stuff. Okay. Um, so that was great. I'm trying to think of else who was there. Sarah was there. Sarah was great. She did a, um, some great uh, great. She did some grip work, um, some PA work too, and she was absolutely fantastic. I know I'm probably missing people. Um, they'll never it forgive happened. you. Uh, right, right. Yeah, they'll so, never tell forgive them, me. Tell them charge it to your head and <laughs> not your heart. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It, 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 it happens sometimes. What I, I have been noticing, though, that you were very specific in your directing, because you're shouting out everybody else. And I got to say, this, this film was, was wonderfully directed. So, oh, again, you. like you did a wonderful job. And I've, I've noticed that as you've been talking about your characters, mm -hmm. um, that you really allowed them to sort of find the character on their own. It wasn't mm -hmm. a lot of dictation. It didn't know, you know, Kelly's like this and she's feeling this, that you established more of a dialogue between... Yeah. Uh, you as the director and the talent, and, and sort of uh, let that relationship drive, or the, the dialogue drive uh, their performance. What was the, how how did you get to do that? Like, why weren't you like Kelly is supposed to do X, Y, and Z? I mean, you get more of a naturalistic and genuine performance, or at least I feel like, when you have that open dialogue with your talent. Um, and like, not only was my talent asking questions, like I think when I was working with Corey, who plays. Uh, older Kelly, like I had her kind of like, all right, let's how how does she think and how does she feel? And at one point, like 
I gave her a feeling and then we were both like, well, this isn't really working, so let's bring it back to what you were previously doing. Mm -hmm. And then like she just, Corey just nailed it, so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I think that dialogue is important to have. Um, I mean, you're not stepping away, you're still there. Um, Cause you, I think it's also important to ask questions cause then at that point, you're asking the correct questions and you're getting those emotional aspects out of your talent. Right, right. It seems like you're really more of a collaborator than a yeah. lot of stories we've heard about what it's like to work mm -hmm. on a set of a, of a fiction film. Yeah. Right? That's what, I, I don't know, I always loved collaborating and working with people and working um, with others and I think it open, it makes set, I mean set can be such a negative thing and it just makes set such a more positive, open, um, place to be in a happy place because sometimes it's not necessarily happy because yeah. there's drama and it's like so sometimes so tense and it's just like I think I or at least I like to think that my set was a little bit more laid back mm. um, and I, everybody did like a fantastic job to really keep and run set um, and just kept it like a well oiled working machine. And you hear about different people's directorial styles mm -hmm. and then, you know some people um, you know, especially in Hollywood, you know, when you have a movie with a certain director, um, you know, I've heard certain actors on in interviews know, okay, I'm going in this, I know that he's a taskmaster, I know right. that it's going to be, you know, hard days, like I know this going in, but he's a great filmmaker, so, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to put that in. And it seems like people, you know, directors specifically really have their own styles as to, you know, how they approach the you know how they approach the, the art of filmmaking what would you say your directorial style is i don't know like i feel sometimes i feel weird even calling myself an artist um just because i feel like i haven't gotten to that point i don't know it's really complicated for me but um i don't i don't know i pull a lot from like i watch a lot of television and i do watch a lot of film um and I pulled a lot from television um and like a lot of my different directors um and yeah, and just like looking at what they're doing and going through like the stuff that they've done. Mm -hmm. um, I also follow like a lot of female directors and what they like go back and even if it didn't necessarily pertain my, to my topic. So like I went back and watched like some stuff that Ava DuVarney did and stuff that um, Lexi Alexander did and um, some of the stuff. I actually also um, look up to one of his name is Joshua Caldwell and the mm -hmm. day before I follow him on Twitter and he's like really talented and really great. And the day before I started or that morning that I started, um, I had tweeted out to him and he, I was like, do you have any advice for me? I'm going in for like my first short film and it's my thesis film. And like he sent me back a block of text messages. Oh, really? Yeah. And wow. it was really, yeah, That'd no, it was like, right. it meant like a lot to me. Yeah. And like, I think I screen capped them and I, I know I have them somewhere on my computer and like, I just need to print them out because it was just, it was really great advice because mm -hmm. he talked about, I think, um, working with your talent, your, your talent, and then um, just like working with other people on set and like, how directing, like, you know, how directors sometimes can go off a little offbeat and yeah. just like bringing it back to set and bringing back to your character. Sounds like it gave you some really, yeah, really great yeah, advice. it was really That's cool. Because awesome. I think we're really excited to get into the second clip. Let's uh, let's roll the second clip. Kelly's been through more foster homes than I have. She'll always be afraid that people will leave her. She'll always be looking for answers. How are you feeling? Nauseous. Did you ever find your family? Your grandparents. That's not what I meant. I looked for a while. And? No. I stopped looking. I already had the answers. I didn't need that information. I already had one crazy older brother and two wonderful parents. All right, so we are introduced to the aunt. Yeah. And, and it's, we were just talking uh, as the clip was playing about yeah. how how uh, she really stood out uh, as a character yeah. and, and as an actress. Um, talk a little bit about 
not only her character and her importance to Kelly, but just a little bit about her as, a, as an actress? Um, well, Sally is great. Um, and I remember her audition very well. Like, we started, my friend and I were auditioning in New York City, um, in this little studio, um, and she just came in and she, like, had a little bit of, I don't know, like, all, she added so much more character than everybody that prior to that I kind of saw was, like, flat, and she just kind of read it completely differently and a little bit different than what I had imagined, and I was just, like, in my head automatically, I was like, <laughs> That's her. I want her. And she just, she kind of just blew me away in the audition. And um, I really wanted to uh, bring her on as that role. And she did a, I mean, she did a fantastic job. Um, and then her relationship with Kelly is that I wanted to, I think this is Kelly's first time of really meeting someone else um, and someone else who's older that's kind of been through this, a similar situation than her and give Kelly some of her, like, be a positive role model. Like, she's had such a negative view of the world, and then, um, you know, there's her relationship with her aunt, and then, like, you know, give, give Kelly, she kind of gives her some agency back mm -hmm. into her character. Now, were, were, you, were you casting for a black woman in that role, or did you just leave it open? We were, I would, we were, um, we kept it we kept it open um something you know i really wanted to bring in a lot of you know tried to bring in a lot more um diversity and she like i said she honestly she was she was the best one for the role and she blew me away and i was like yes i want her it was really authentic yeah no as, she as was soon as she started speaking it yeah. was very genuine. yeah and no totally and there's she like i feel like she she reaches out to her and that's the, that was definitely something that i was looking now, stepping, now that we've seen two clips, right. taking a step back uh, and taking a larger look at, at your approach to this, are there any specific broader policy issues in relation to adoption and foster care that you were really looking to speak to the audience about? Not really. I really just wanted to focus on um, her, like, her relationship and really her thoughts and her feelings of what her, like what she want, her personal story. Like I didn't want, a lot of people sometimes can make a political film and that was not what I wanted to do. And like there were other films that I watched, there was like another, um, there's a short film called Removed, which I watched a bunch of times, which also deals a lot more with uh, foster care. Um, but I wanted to focus more on um, like her personal story and um, like just what she was thinking and what she was feeling in those moments. And what struck me as what she might have been thinking and feeling, it, you know, that was also a very genuine performance and it reminded me of uh, when kids start to get a little older and in the system for a while, I had young people quoting back to me that they knew exactly how the system benefited from them going mm -hmm. from placement type to placement type. They knew how much money was freed up sometimes when their bed was moved from a certain type of facility step down to a less restrictive setting. Uh, and when you can have a young person understand what they contribute monetarily to a system, that's a really unfortunate thing, but they're wise beyond their years. And even though you didn't have Kelly say that, her demeanor showed that she understood a lot of what had happened to her. Yeah. Um, and that's, that really struck me as, as a great point. That was something that we, I talked to both my actresses. So the little girl in the film is played by Emma Silly. I think I'm saying her last name correctly. And then um, I'm going to mess up Corey's, Corey's last name. I'm sorry, Corey. But uh, Corey was really great. Um, and what, um, she just like, she nailed the role. And, and that was actually something that we talked about. A lot about how and then that was like I she would ask me a question and then I would try to turn it back on her um, and ask her a question like what do you well, what do you think she is thinking in this moment where do you think you want to go with her um, but yeah that was just that was a conversation that we were trying to have on set constantly and especially with um, the little girl in the film of just trying to make it authentic to bring it back to the older version of Kelly so there was a discussion in this clip about um, finding, finding a friend, finding right. your, your birth friend. And um, again, this struck home for me because I, you know, I'm, I am adopted and I did have the opportunity right. to find my birth family. So um, that was a really, you know, clearly life changing, you know, life changing yeah. moment for me. And if I, if I trace the film correctly, then uh, Darcy 
and the aunt, I, I don't I can't uh, I don't know her character's name, but if I chase the film correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, okay. that it seemed like Darcy's family adopted the aunt when mm -hmm. she was younger. Yep. And now that they are older, Darcy has decided to adopt mm -hmm. Kevin. So it's generation. Yep. It's 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 uh, Darcy as a boy yep. had an adopted sister and then grew up and decided to adopt a daughter yep. himself. Is there any reason why you, you decided to make it generational like that? No, not really. Like I think it just goes back to uh, Sally's character. Um, and just wanting to give Kelly someone that she can really relate to on um, a more personal level. And I think, you know, like Darcy has seen what her sister has gone through and, um, you know, kind of wants to do the same and just like provide, you know, a whole, like a warm, welcoming home for somebody that needs it. But it wasn't. I don't know, I didn't, I don't know, I, I was thinking about it, but not like to a certain extent, I was like, oh, I have to put this in there. The, um, you know, it's, it's so interesting that, that, I know we talked a lot about the aunt's character, yeah. but it, it, it's so interesting that you weren't uh, necessarily casting for a black woman, but a black woman got the role, because it added a whole different yeah. dynamic to the story, yeah. you know? I mean, it's, it's now Darcy's family, uh, adopted a young black child, and now like she's able to, to inform Kelly about that, and it, it, I just find it really, really interesting. As you know, just as a from a production standpoint, mm -hmm. that that decision wasn't made beforehand, but it was you know sort of made just by who played the role the best. Yeah, and it did. It added so much. You know, it, it, it added a lot of layers to the film. It did. Yeah. It did. It did. I mean, the, the, the layers of the story are like crazy. Um, you know, do you think? When we're talking about Kelly, mm -hmm. we're talking about a child who has been from one home to another home to another home to another home. And, um, you know, this discussion is going to be a, a bit obvious, but I think it's, it's worth discussing, right. especially if um, there are any children watching who are in the foster care system, you know, now. How do you think, and it's, it's, it's almost impossible to, you know, put yourself in the shoes because it's, you know, it's, it's such a harsh situation, but, you know, what do you think it does to a child to be moved from one place to another place to another place without having a, you know, a, a permanent place to stay? And Madam asked you the same question because you work with, with, with kids like this. I'm closing this to both of you. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, like I said before, I, I after spending a, a couple of years and, and just lots of one-on-one -on -one time and, and, and uh, workshops where we were helping them understand how to get more of a say, it, 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 there's some level of being jaded when you've really tried to, to participate and you feel not listened to. I mean, that's the, the biggest theme is they've been treated in a way, uh, that's broadly, broadly speaking, where decisions are being made about them and the times they've given input, they found that it wasn't listened to. Mm -hmm. So how many times can you give genuine input about your own well-being and then see that it was disregarded or just asked symbolically? And at a certain point, certain people have different points where they, they don't want to keep going through that anymore. Um, and you know, through all that, there's those young people that no matter what, they don't lose that, that sense of hope. And, you know, I, I got to meet lots of young people that, that didn't get adopted. They aged out of, of the system, and then they came back as some of the greatest mentors for young people that I've, I've ever met in my whole life. Um, so it's very unfortunate, but it, it, by, it by no means breaks everybody. Um, but you just have to step back and think, how would I react? And, and you know, one of the, the, the biggest misconceptions when I, I, I did work in that area was, People forget that if you're in foster care, it's through no fault of, of your own. It was through the actions and decisions of others, uh, as opposed to other systems that you might find yourself in that are a little more related to your own actions. And that's really a stigma, I think, that a lot of, of young people take most personally, that people that don't understand think that they did something to put themselves in a situation, when it couldn't be farther from the truth, and instead other people cause a situation where they'll naturally have 
repercussions from, from living in those those types of conditions, especially when it's place to place to place. But through it all, I, I think there's just an amazing amount of, of young people that just stay positive and turn into role models. Yeah. I mean, I've read, again, I'm bringing it back to the research I did, but I saw like a lot of that of people going back and wanting to kind of just give back because they have been through that situation. Um, but I think, I mean, I can really only say from Kelly's point of view with her being in the foster system um, is that, I hate using the word broken, but like she's jaded. Jaded's yeah. a better word. So she's jaded a lot. She thinks that she can't find a home, that she's not really wanted, and there's like this feeling of just wanting to be hugged or just wanting to be like loved and um, you know, uh, she at the end it finally comes for her, but it took her all the way until she she was a teenager, and I think that kind of, you know, um, I, one of the foster homes I had her like going back because like oh the parents had a baby and then they're like oh nope just kidding we don't want you anymore, um, and that was like an actual story that I read and I was like how does someone go through an adoption process or start an, ado an adoption process? and then ha end up having a biological child, like does blood really mean that much to you? And it again comes back to the fact that like I firmly believe in like, you know, friends being family and finding your own family and that's what she does ultimately. Um, there are so many of my friends that I consider my family and just because we're um, not, well you know, just because we aren't blood related doesn't mean that you're not my family. Yeah, my dad said something really important one time, he just says, Families who you want in your life. Yeah. And you know, I think that came across well in, in what you were trying to do with this story. Absolutely. I think you, you brought up aging out of the system. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's a, that's a whole other, I mean, we could do a whole other show. Like, yeah. You know, just kids who, who age out. But I think it's, it's, it's worth talking about because, um, you, you know, Kelly's older. Yeah. And she's, a, she's a teenager. So yeah. the, the, the likelihood, right, is that. Um, even though the Darcy's, or the Darcy's, even though Darcy <laughs> yeah. uh, has accepted her, um, you know, it, it's likely that she'll only be like legally under his guardianship for three, four years, right? Right before she she's an adult, right? Mm -hmm. She turns eighteen and, and she's she's legally on her own, and and, and we know just you know from reality that um, a lot of kids age out of the system without ever, you know, being adopted. And there's a, there's a certain degree to which you kind of feel like, well, you know, these are kids who who didn't have parents, mm -hmm. who are now, you know, put out on their own. A lot of them uh, get pregnant. A lot of them have issues and, and don't have the background of being raised by, by, by a family uh, on their own. I feel like that's, um, yeah. that can be, that can be a, a pretty harsh situation. But I'm glad that Kelly, you know, had a chance to come back from that. I want to talk a little bit more about that, but I want to roll to clip three first. Sure. I feel like that's a really, really important uh, tie-in to everything yeah, that we're yeah. saying. So let's roll clip three and we'll, we'll come right back. That was a really powerful clip. Um, one moment in particular that, that I just have to ask you about. Um, as, I, as I watched your film, one moment just made me go, wow, that, that says it all. And this was full of those. Mm -hmm. But when 
a young Kelly crosses her fingers. That just sums up every emotion we've talked about tonight mm -hmm. um, without saying a word. Uh, talk to us about that decision and, and how that particular scene came into play. So this is actually a really funny story. Um, I did not tell her to do that. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, that's, no, that's that was amazing. all. That was all Emma, um, and that was just something. I think we were pre, we had, were speeding, we were recording a little bit before that, and she was talking to my friend Ashley, who was driving us around the car. We was we were driving all around um, Connecticut for a lot of those shots, and um, I think my friend Ashley said something or the other, and she just like genuinely like does this. And I was going when I was in the edit bay, and I was going back and looking at all this footage. I just like I found her doing this, and I was. like, <laughs> I like had a moment because it like you said it sums up yeah. everything that like and brings the film back home and you know the of that next moment of um and is this house the next one am I going to finally lay my feet in this house like and, and oh please not again yeah not, exactly yeah no please totally not, don't um and uh Emma I mean she's she was really talented with um, everything that we gave her and we were just continually uh, talking with her and like I would ask literally ask her questions of like okay well, what what do you think about like your character like how would you if this was you personally um, how would you react to it and stuff like that and I gave her like actual little actions and be like all right I need you Sometimes, um, or like, I would be like, hey, I need you to be like really angry because you just left. I would also give her a little scenario. So I need you to be angry or I need you to be sad. Like, I need you to be like devastated. One of my favorite shots, which I think was in there, was with, which, with her just like leaning back and just like kind of dead to the world. And I was like, just look tired. She was like, or I think her answer was like, well, that's easy. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, she was really great with that. So. She seems wise beyond her years. Yeah, yeah got those decisions great. on the fly. I am. I'm. I'm fairly new to film. I have a writing background, yeah. right? So, and in my and my interest in film was, you know, just having a different mode of medium to tell a story. But that's definitely one of the things that I found I've loved about it. That you have the potential to find things like, you know, this clip of her mm -hmm. with her hands crossed that was never in the script. You know, wasn't written in. Wasn't anything. But just something that was caught on film, you know, unintentionally off the fly, ended up becoming such a powerful part of that. I mean, in, in writing, you you dictate everything, right. you know, that you're going to put down. But just having the opportunity of having this perfect moment, you know, come together that was completely, you know, unintentional is just wonderful. I think that's the beauty about being on set and then going into the post room. And um, I also have a huge passion for editing and. Um, because I feel like that's where you really get to tell the story. Like you can go on set, and uh, and it, I mean it happened to us too. Like you know, you go on set, it's going to be you think it's going to be one thing, um, and for the majority it is. But then you go back in to once you're done, you go into post, and it just turns out to be like this really beautiful, wonderful story. And then you go in and you find all these like genuine moments of like people do like Emma um, who played Little Kelly who just she crosses her fingers and it's just like incredibly powerful and I think we actually we originally I was gonna, originally going to start that whole flashback scene in the beginning and then um, and then it just was like the flashbacks were so powerful and then we needed something to kind of even it out a little bit so we're like all right let's put it in the middle with a little bit of flashbacks so you get the idea of like you know what she's been through and everything um, and then really bring it home um, Toward the end, so. the fact that you were able to do that without actually showing the homes, mm -hmm. like I mean, that was really, really great storytelling. You know, I mean, it was clear what she was going through. It was clear what that flashback was about. Yet we didn't see any of the foster homes right. that you know that she had been in. But it was clear, you know, from clip to clip, um, that she's moving around, and we and we, we clearly got that. So kudos, thank to, you. To the well, director I mean, it's that. like the. It's just this constant feeling, I didn't want you to ever feel like you were settling down. So like, all right, before that door closes or um, before she looks back away or something like that, I want you to continue moving, all right, like she's in a different, she's in a different outfit, all right, like this other house just gave up on her. Um, so, and that also goes back to the carousel too of that circle, yeah, like the, cir the spinning and the circling of just feeling like you're going around and around and around and around and it's like this nauseous feeling. Did you find it actually harder in the end to really 
boil. I know it's it's a better effect when every second is is in motion. You're able to distill it down. Um, but it, as a filmmaker, is it harder to go from that 10, 15 minute story to a really powerful four to five minute story? It was extreme. It was extremely hard. Um, so we actually she actually met her her mom. Um, in this because she's at her adoption party um, and her mom just shows up and it was actually like the scene just was not working at all um, and the way I wrote it was awkward and then it was even more awkward um, I mean both actresses are great um, and and it just was like all right I know this is not working and I kept leaving it in I was like what do I do with this and just like taking it to a good friend of mine and one of my professors and I'm just like what do I do with this? This seems like not working. And they were both like, just cut it out. And I was like, well, is the story still there? And they were like, yeah, like you still, you, it's a five minute little short, but the, it's still extremely impactful. You tell the story of like acceptance and her like finally coming home in the end. And so. How many changes have you made to Kelly so far? How, how many, how many, uh, how many cuts have you gone through? Oh, for this one? Mm -hmm. A lot. <laughs> um, it, we shot this actually, next weekend will be a, a year ago that we shot, and then um, I was like really tired and exhausted and a little laid back, and I was like, all right, I know I have so much post work I have to do, and then a friend of a friend who, he was doing sound, was like, well, you're, so, you're still not linked, uh, you know, you still haven't connected your video and your audio together. Um, let me do that for you. And I was like, all right, well, if you want to be my assistant editor, go, go right ahead. So um, he did that, and uh, that was great. And then at that point, I could actually really focus in the, on the story. And then I was going through this. I was going, at first, I started with going just by the script um, and be like, okay, this happens and this happens and this happens. And then it's just like, then I had that cut, and then I did another cut, and then just I kept, you know, going cut after cut after cut. And it was exhaust I mean, it's exhausting because you're trying to find out where the best story is. Yeah. And that is ob also obvious. And um, the cut that we actually had for, um, our school does a film festival. Well, they'll have this one, they'll have one this year, but not the year after because they're actually going up to a two year program. That's beside the point. Um, they, the music changed. So I used, uh, other music, and then uh, I have a friend, a very good friend of mine who I love and adore. Uh, she has a friend, her main actress in her, in her short film um, is also a composer, and so she offered, my friend Andrea, she um, offered to help pay, she was like, I think Kelly's great, and you did wonderful work. So her and I, um, uh, she was like, my actress is also a composer and um, it also helps out her too and um, she did it, the composer is actually from South Africa and um, Alnet, her name's Alnet Pretorius and she did a fantastic job, like I couldn't have imagined it being any better, like she hit it, she really, like Alnet and I, we talked through email, we talked through an application called Line um, and we just constantly were talking back and forth about like what Kelly was thinking, what she was feeling, and, and we talked again about like this revolving door and you know the circular motion and like you know I sent her she saw the original cut with the old music that I had in and she really like nailed it on like just nailed it with the music. I think I noticed that that the cut from YouTube and then the cuts from the clips yeah. had different music. Yep. And I yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I noticed that and the yep. the the. the because with the different music, it definitely added yeah. like more texture. I mean, it, it added a lot. So kudos to the new composer. Yeah, she's yeah, amazing. Absolutely. And you mentioned Sacred Heart. Uh, I did mention the, Sacred Heart. My best friend from childhood is currently in the program, in their master's program. Wait, uh, wait, Sacred Heart? Wait, <laughs> yeah. in Stanford, Connecticut? Yeah. Wait, yeah. who is it? Tim McCluskey. He's in their mass comm program. Big shout out to Tim McCluskey. Okay. Uh, he's, he'll he'll be calling in this show soon as a guest as okay. well. Right. Um, is but he, I've, I've heard great great is things. Is he in the wait? Because I think they have the mass communication one, and then is he in the film and television one? Mm -hmm. So he worked with. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and he's got nothing. They're great guys. To say and and he yeah. actually had me taking a hard look at it too. Yeah, but, it's uh, yeah, the pro. I mean, I am. Very, I feel very lucky. Like. Um, going to give a shout out to Sacred Heart University right now, but uh, in the film and television program, I, it was 
like literally one of the best years of my life other than the few internships that I've done like I could have not imagined it to go any more beautiful and wonderful and like the people that I met are again like family like they're they're people that I trust um, and even though I'm on the west coast now but uh, it's like you, you take it to them and you're like all right like tell me truthfully and honestly and like granted it might not be feedback you want to hear but it's feedback you need to hear yeah absolutely what is next for Jacqueline and what is next for Kelly so with Kelly I am currently trying to write the future um, I'm looking at, like I've downloaded a bunch of scripts um, and reading those so like I downloaded room okay. um, oh, yeah. and I'm yeah. reading like yeah. I mean room is one of my favorite movies um, and I did that one because of the mother-daughter relationship and Brie Larson and Jacob from like are fantastic um, and that's one of my favorite movies um, so I downloaded room and I did a f- bunch of others um, and just reading script after script after script and then also um, going back I think I had like 60 pages at once and then like threw it all away and I was like oh we're gonna start over again um and just hitting writer's block with that um I'm also currently writing a pilot which is a historical fiction um but I also go back and forth of well do I want to make this a feature or do I just want to highlight one of the women that were in this program so I keep going back and forth right now I'm like I really just want to highlight this one woman um she was amazing and then for me, I'm currently editing a, uh, I'm working on a inspirational YouTube series. Um, and he is, the producer is bringing in, um, like, we just, or he just talked to a woman, a cancer survivor, she's 26, and she's also a tattoo model. Um, so I was just editing that, and then um, he has a bunch of other ones that he's doing, um, bringing in some... I think high affluent people from what I've heard Um, and then I'm doing that and then like I'm also just editing a project on the side right now that I'm waiting for voiceover from a friend of mine so a lot going on yeah Yeah, I like to stay busy otherwise I get really bored no I understand definitely yeah all right so I'm gonna ask that one key question you were at Sacred Heart which is in Connecticut Connecticut yeah and uh, you now live in LA. I do live in LA, yep. Do you have to move to LA if you want to break into the film industry? It depends on what you do. Um, I mean, I my, my ultimate goal is to direct television. Okay. Um, so a lot of the scripted TV is there. And there, I know also, um, what is it? It's American Crime, I think, is coming back to LA and moving their production to LA, which is also kind of interesting, um, but uh, I think it just depends on what you, like, what you want to do, because, like, New, if you, New York's very more independent film, and then LA is more TV, okay. and I just, I don't know, I think it just, it depends on what you want to do. I eventually want to direct television and, you know, direct a Marvel movie, but that's beside the point. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it just depends on what you want to do, so... Well, we're getting ready, getting ready to wrap up here, but personally, I just wanted to say, and I'm sure you will as well, thank you for tackling this subject. Oh, thank uh, you. Thanks this, for having this, me. This meant a lot to both of us, and uh, these experiences were, were one of the main reasons I went back to school, to okay. learn how to help tell stories like this better. Yeah. Um, so, and you just did an amazing job of thank it, you. and we just wanted to say thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having this, me. Uh, yeah, this is this is incredible. And it's our first pre-produced Yay. episode, yeah. so yeah. you, you are our that. first special yeah. guest that was not Yay. in studio, but uh, uh, we'll have the opportunity to see yourself uh, uh, on Listen Vision, you know, when we when we air the show, so we are really excited about this, and again, awesome. we want to thank you for Love coming on. Love to send on. me a link, so I can oh, post yeah. it oh, on you'll get, all the social media You'll get plenty of yeah. links. Yeah. 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 That, that is we do good with that. <laughs> Don't you worry. Links, tags, pictures, they'll be, they'll be all over the yeah. place. We'll be good. Great. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you guys for tuning in once again to Shorts and Focus, uh, where we show short films a lot. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, we always, always, always love and appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, make sure you tune in next week, uh, next Monday, for our next episode.
Hi, I'm Zeke Dowdy. And I'm Kayeen Thomas. And so we're the producers of Shorts in Focus. He's also the host. I am. I am the host, so you're going to see my face a lot. Shorts in Focus is a show that will be aired on ListenVisionLive.com. It's ListenVisionLive.com. We will be featuring short film projects. So we're going to screen it, and then we're going to have a conversation with the filmmakers themselves. The actors, the actresses, mm. producers, directors. There's no telling who's going to be on the show, but they will always be able to have a discussion about what it is that you just saw. So whether you have a narrative, documentary, hell, music video, give us a shout at Zeke at shortsandfocus.tv or, or Kayeen <laughs> at shortsandfocus.tv. And remember, your project has to be short. Every Monday night at 8 p.m. on listenvisionlive.com. All right, so what you want to do is on Monday nights, 8 o'clock p.m., you want to go to www.listenvisionlive.com. You can do it on your cell phone or you can do it on your laptop, although we know that you'll be doing it from your cell phone. Once again, you want to go to www.listenvisionlive.com. Mondays at 8 o'clock p.m. Go to the site, hit play. We will be streaming live. So Mondays, <laughs> 8 o'clock p.m., ListenVisionLive.com. Tune in, check us out, we're sure you'll love it.